All right, and we are live on YouTube. Good afternoon, YouTube land. I have our guest here, Dr. Diane Hamilton. We're about to fire things off, but as usual, per usual, on YouTube, we like to start off with a little bit of a hello, just to make sure we welcome everybody who's logged on and watching. So say hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, quite simple as that. Okay, so what I'm going to go ahead and do right now is I'm going to fire up the uh, the audio only side on Spreaker, so that way those that are on Spreaker we can actually have that official intro. And I have to fix this audio so that it actually is clear. But let's go ahead and get started. So quiet on the set. We're starting up the studio. All right, welcome to the Money Lab live podcast, episode number 72, the nobody works, but money is there, money story. All right, welcome back to another live broadcast of the Money Lab podcast from the Six Figure Academy. I am your host, Wei Hong, from the Six Figure Academy. And this is the podcast where we give you tips, strategies, and interviews with other entrepreneurs and thought leaders on how to create that ultimate six-figure entrepreneurial lifestyle, free of bad money stories, money anxiety, and stress, and a higher level of self-awareness so that you can monetize your dreams and execute your genius. Now, if you haven't already downloaded our free ebook from Money Anxiety, to Six Figure Mastery, make sure you go to go.thesixfigureacademy.com. Just put it in your browser there and get it there. It's the perfect complement to all the things we discuss on this show. And quite frankly, we've been told it could change your life. Now, if you're joining us live today and you're not on YouTube live already, make sure you get on Spreaker.com or download the Spreaker app on your mobile device and search for the hashtag, hashtag the money lab. For those of you who don't know what hashtag is, that pound sign, the money lab, so that you can join us in the chat room and ask questions interact with our guests, um, and even request a specific topic that we can discuss that will help support you in your quest for that uh, ideal six-figure lifestyle. Now, while you're there, subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. You can catch us every week. For all of the ways to find us, go to thesixfigureacademy.com forward slash radio for all the details. And if there's something you love about what you hear on this episode today, and I almost can guarantee that you will, and you know that it could help someone you care about, remember, sharing is caring. So share this show to that person. Now, I'm really excited about the guest we have today, not only because she's such a joy to hang out with and talk to, and we kind of get, you know, things get away from us when we have these conversations, and not only because of her unique money story, which she will share, you got to pay attention to that. But the, what the big thing I want to do is for you to listen, the audience, listen for this unique uh, process that she's going to be introducing and sharing with us about curiosity. Now, for those of you who know me and have been around me for a little bit, curiosity has always been one of my biggest driving force on how I get to the core of how, you know, what is keeping and holding my students, my clients back because I'm just straight up curious. Well, our guest today has this code breaking down, so you don't want to miss it, and you want to really pay attention to what she's talking, what she's going to be talking about. Now, our guest today is Dr. Diane Hamilton, and she's a nationally syndicated radio host, speaker, moderator, consultant, author, and educator. And then through her work as the MBA program chair at the Forbes School of Business. How cool is that? You know, yes, last week we had an, a person on the Oprah show, and this week we have someone from the Forbes School of Business and then several other universities as well. She's taught over a thousand business courses. She has a PhD in business management, certified in Myers Briggs, MBTI, emotional intelligence, and she's developed her own new assessment tool, author of three books, all kinds of cool stuff. And the fourth book that is coming, three books already. Uh, one called It's Not You, It's Your Personality. The, four, the <laughs> book coming out is Cracking the Curiosity Code. So I'm really, really excited. Welcome to the show, Dr. Diane. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Wei. This is going to be so much fun. We had so much fun when you were on my show. I know. <laughs> so I like having it be a little you know, opposite here. We'll see how this goes. We'll probably talk forever, though. I know, kind of <laughs> exactly. So i got to make sure the clock is there, perhaps maybe yeah. even put on an alarm, because if anything right. goes the way the last... Three, four times we spoke. <laughs> yeah. Time will just disappear. We have fun. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, so um, yeah, I mean, 
let's start with just to, let's just get this out of the way because the thing about the money lab it's really about entrepreneurship and about money and everything like that and everything's related so but one of the most important things and what I, I i can't wait to have you share with our audience is that you know oftentimes we hear different money stories and they're all kind of similar in a variety of different levels you know like not having wor- not worthy enough or not having enough or making just enough and those types of things and those money stories start to run rampant and and get in the way of their growth for most entrepreneurs. But you have a unique story when it comes to money, you know, in terms of what you grew up with. So uh-huh. w- without going too far into it, I want you to share the story, <laughs> of well, your money story I, that you grew up with. It's just a little bit different. Um, most people have a working father, a working mother, maybe both. Uh, I had neither. Uh, both of my parents stayed home, which is very strange. Right. Uh, my- <laughs> I uh, I come from a family. My the, my last name's Hamilton, and so there's the uh, Hamiltons in uh, St. Louis mm-hmm. who were successful in the shoe business. Oh, cool! And so my great grandfather created the International Shoe Company. I hope mm-hmm. I get all these r- people right because I really didn't. Go I was hoping around. I was hoping you say <laughs> Hamilton watches because I was like I was hoping that too. I have one. <laughs> I bought my husband one. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah these are great watches, actually. <laughs> this is cool. It looks like a Star Trek, like a. Triangle. Oh, His, oh yeah. yeah. Mine's the um, the railroad, whatever. <laughs> they're whatever cool that watches. Is. Yeah, I know they yeah. are. They're great watches, and the, there's no battery and everything like that. But anyway, you know, <laughs> there's a few Hamiltons out there, and I'm not related to most of them, but the, the <laughs> one I am <laughs> related to, uh, my great grandfather, uh-huh. uh, C D P Hamilton, created the um, he, you know a shoe company. He was part of the International Shoe Company a long time ago. Uh-huh. He uh-huh. was an author too, which I found out later, oh, which I didn't oh. know. I, 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 until like a couple years ago. What did he write about and, shoes? Or, or? No, uh, he wrote about like uh, I can't remember what it's called, but before Bridge, the card game Bridge, there was a um, oh, oh. Trist or something like that. It, it was a game that everybody played before Bridge, huh. and he wrote this talk about neurotic. He wrote like six hundred pages of every single card game hand you could play. And I'm looking at this. I found it on eBay. I'm like, wow. wow. He's a strategist, I, I huh? was a really you, smart guy. But did you buy the book? I did. I okay, don't remember. Good. I gotta find. I could. I, I looked at about two pages. I'm like, oh my. Uh, I can't. <laughs> It was like it's too much. I can't handle it. Yeah, it was too much. (laughs) Because I knew my dad had written books, but I I didn't know that his grandfather did. Uh huh. So um, then everybody worked in the shoe company, and then uh, my father was born legally blind. He had two percent vision, so he really wasn't uh, back then. They just took care of him because there was Mm -hmm. this Hamilton shoe money, you know, that took care of things. That's so funny. yeah, I know. Hamilton shoe so, money. Did the money come I out of the know. shoe? <laughs> I know. They, well, they were really a successful family, I guess, sure. in the shoe business for a long time. And my uncle actually became very successful. He created the Hamilton shoe company later. Oh, cool. So his his brother, Penn Hamilton, and his other brother, Everett Hamilton, worked at this Hamilton shoe company. And so they all were in the shoe business. Right. And um, I get married with children on my head when I think of the shoe business. That's right. Hey, yeah. Hey, but the Bundys? <laughs> the Bundys, yeah. So, but they did really well, and but because my dad was not really capable of doing a lot yeah. back then, they just kind of just took care of him. So he stayed home, and my mom stayed home, and they just lived off of that. Wow. So it was a really kind of different upbringing yeah. because money wasn't really an issue. Right. I mean, and I didn't really get my work ethic from watching them because right. they didn't do it. You know, they didn't work. I, right. You know, my dad wasn't lazy, though. He did a lot of things. He was extremely motivated to do um, the things he liked. Like, he could see enough that he could actually read uh, if it was really, like, right here next yeah, to his Yeah, so face. how do they determine that? How do they know the figure it was 2%? I don't. You know, it's... He probably exaggerated. But no, he seemed very, very blind, though. If you were around him, he really did not see. And he um, he used to tell me that it was like having a glass of water and you just drop milk into the water and trying to look through it. And then I, I remember asking him, what was it like looking through? Cause he had one eye, it was completely blind. Mm-hmm. And then the other one, he had 2%, they said, right. and it was because the, deta- uh, the retina had completely detached. My grandmother had the swine flu oh. or they said, oh, and God. so anyway, okay. but he, um, he said it was the, to look out of the blind eye was like looking out of your knee is what he told me as a kid. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. It, it totally messed with my head, right? <laughs> you know, like, so you spent your life so I wonder what it's like looking out trying to look out of your knee <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> He had a point. There's nothing to his eye to make it be able to see. Right. And it was like looking at it. I, but it's so funny because I've had Eric Weimayer. I've had several blind people on my show. Mm-hmm. I ask all of them that question. Is yeah. it like looking out of your knee? Because a lot of them had vision and then lost it. So they know the uh, difference, right? Right, right, right. And w- one told me it was like that. One told me it was like seeing black. And another one felt like it was like underwater or something. It was like completely different for all three of them. I yeah, was- I, 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 had, I had torn my retina before playing volleyball, and uh-huh. I had no oh. idea that I'd done that. And so I remember it was flapping around. So it oh. was it was an interesting situation because I thought I just needed rest. It's <laughs> like I hit in the eye. I was like, oh, I think I'm going to go home, guys. Dizzy. This doesn't yeah. feel good. And as yeah. I'm taking a shower, I remember it was apparently it, that's what was happening. It was flapping in and out. So it was getting in my vision and getting out of my vision. And at one yeah. point, I was washing my face. I looked up, and literally one eye. Um, was white. It was like completely white. Wow! And it was it was like looking through a, a glass of milk. Maybe. Yeah, I well I mean, you, you know, can't see I, through a glass I, of milk. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, it wasn't well, black, but it was white. You know, which is he, fascinating. Yeah, I, it really made me think. You know, but I, he used to say things that used to just mess with my head like that. All. <laughs> <time. laughs> but uh, he was an interesting guy because he would um, spend his time doing mental things you know like writing books about okay. like prose weird prose poetry kind of things okay cool. and um but he I, got, I learned you know how they say you're not supposed to multitask well in our family that was what everybody does i mean <laughs> it's like that's how i survive i mean he would have his books on audio well, but they aren't taped back then they were these giant record albums you know and, and <laughs> he'd be listening to those he'd have the newspaper which you could kind of read if you put like right here he'd have the sports game on he'd have he had like 10 things going at once. So I think that's where I got it. But he's, he's like um, compensating for the fact that he couldn't really see anything, just seeing through his know. ears. I think he would have been that way anyway. anyway. Not like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but so, so he, he yeah. was really a busy guy and yeah. he, he didn't really work. It, uh, his, I mean, he, t- he just basically did that kind of thing. And then my mom was a housewife, you know, back then in the 60s. Everybody right. was a housewife back right. then. Domestic so, engineer, I like to call it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's just kind of that part was typical, but yeah. my dad was not. All right. So so how did that then shape your perception of money? Because uh, I think you did mention in before this before the show that it, it, it basically had you growing up not really understanding really what management or money management is all about or money or something. How did that then shape your perception of money as you were getting into the workforce yourself? You know, it, it had a couple of um, factors that affected it. I I would say I I saw that they were dependent on somebody else for money. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really like that Mm -hmm. from watching that Mm -hmm. because you're at somebody else's mercy. I mean, right. basically, right. Yeah. and that taught me that. Well, I, I don't like. I don't want to use somebody else's money. I want my own money. I, right. I think what the biggest thing I got from that. Right. Um, he. Uh, I, I think that it just kind of showed me. I guess I saw what other people lived like, and I saw it was kind of different from my life. It, my next door neighbors owned U-Haul, and they were a very well-to-do uh, family, but they didn't really spend a lot of money either because he was putting all the money into the company. Yeah. So, uh, um, like most entrepreneurs, you, right? Or whole right. Whole and so they ended up being very wealthy and successful later, you know, but sure. I, I had very strange, uh, upbringing, uh, around so many different types of, of people, a lot of successful people where I lived. So mm-hmm. I, I guess I, I, admired some of that but I wasn't I think until I got older where I had a couple of professors that really impacted my idea of, of reality oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or teachers I had a teacher in, right. in middle school who was um, a great algebra teacher I love this guy yeah and I, I think I learned a lot from him to just think logically and to prepare right. more for the future and I I always liked uh money and finance. I, mm-hmm. I remember when my mom gave me a, a checkbook when I was a kid. You know those big checkbooks that you have at yeah. work? The uh-huh. big long checks? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And I, that's what she used for checks as, when I was a kid. For some reason, that's what they had for checks. And she, I guess they expired. So she gives me this checkbook. 
I was so excited. I mean, I was such a nerd. I wanted like cash registers and checkbooks were like my <laughs> ideal of what I <laughs> I didn't even think about the money behind them. It was just something cool to me to right, have my right. big checkbook to play with. And um, so I, I guess I've always kind of been attracted to business, which was kind of fascinating later in life because it really wasn't until a couple of years ago that I, my cousin came to town. Keith had uh, been here for, I hadn't seen him in like 40 years or something, some long time, right? Wow. And he was telling me about, well, there was my grandmother owned a business uh, company that they taught people how to use computer, I mean, typewriters and things. I'm like, wow. I was always wondering where my business sense came from since yeah. nobody else cared about business, really. <laughs> my sister, brother, you know, they went in different directions. And, yeah. and then it kind of made sense when I started hearing that, I guess the Hamiltons also owned this big arena, like a sports arena, huh. and huh. they had all kinds of businesses that they ran. I didn't even know anything about until wow. I was, you know, a couple of years ago. And because my, they all lived in St. Louis, and right. I, I was raised in Arizona. And, uh, 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 I mean, they came out, but they were so much older. My dad was 42 when I was born. So, okay. you know, they were just so much older that all of my cousins were older. My grandparents died when I was young kind of thing that yeah. you just never got the stories. Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of cool to, to learn that they did all these things. So. so so I wonder what was, you know, because you hear these stories about people who are, essentially grown up on to a certain degree with a silver spoon in their mouth, right? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. and not having to really kind of struggle around money, which, you know, which is a struggle in itself because then you never you never get a different perspective around right. how money is actually flows and comes in, it just shows up, right? Right. <laughs> and and which, yeah. Yeah, and it's then it's different. <laughs> right, exactly. It's totally different. And and uh-huh. the thing is, you know, people assume was like, well, of course you would have this acumen and this natural desire to be in business and stuff like that. But that's not always the case. You get you get a lot of these kids growing up not caring about money and not having this appreciation for money. But you on the other hand, you had a different perspective, say, I don't want to live like that. You know, I'm, Yeah, it it well, is different. You know, I can remember being fifteen, um, and I wanted to work at 15 and I walked about a mile and it's like 120 out in Phoenix. So you're crazy. Right. Okay. So you're I, <laughs> your shoes are melting and it's no, no, like- they do. You actually sink into the, the cement. <laughs> so I, I went to go, they had a uh, Mexican food restaurant that I thought, Oh, I'll be a hostess. Right. And I tried to get a job before I was even 16, but they wouldn't hire me because it was illegal to hire me, I guess. Yeah. And you know, I had to wait. But so I always had this and I can remember turning 16 thinking, Oh, I could finally work now, and I got so excited, and I worked uh, as a hotel operator, my first job. Oh, wow. So I go, yeah, I went to work from school from 7.30 to 2.30, and then I'd work 3 to 11 oh, every okay. day. You know, and, that's, yeah. that's, you know that's, a, that's a fascinating, because I think now that I think back, I was not allowed to get a job either. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad said, no, your, your job is to go to school, and you have oh, to concentrate, good. and that's all yeah. you do. But I also had a desire to work. I, I don't know why. What I, age I, did you work? Did you? I, I actually had a little side business while I was in high school. Uh huh. <laughs> I had something you can talk about. Well, no, yeah. I mean, was yeah. <laughs> no? I had come across. I had come across a uh-huh. uh, a resource to uh-huh. um uh, to do uh, wholesale uh, audio programs and CDs and stuff like that. And without even thinking about profit margins and stuff like that, I just created this flat rate um, BCD program where I would hand out slips to my fellow students and they would order and and mm-hmm. I'm, basically I would order those things and we would get it at, I think the profit margin was like 20, 30% or something like that. But I mean, back then where CDs were 20 bucks a pop and I was able to uh, give anybody any CD they want for 10 bucks, you know. Um, yeah, it, you know, it, and I don't know because my parents are both not entrepreneurs. We only have really on my dad's side of the family one entrepreneur in that side of the family. My mom's mm-hmm. side of the family, yes, but you know, I, I wonder if it's in the background when we hear chatter or talk about our relatives through our parents and everything that they're <laughs> just this little side conversations about businesses and everything like that that we yeah. as children just pick that up. That's interesting because that ties into my book about curiosity when we talk about that later. Uh, yeah. That's, that I, I, falls into environment. Yeah. So, I, I, want yeah. To, I definitely want to talk about yeah. that because I'm curious about <laughs> curiosity. I'm, I'm, I mean, like, I'm like the consummate curious coach. I mean, that, I mean mm-hmm. one of the things that my students and clients always say is like, you know, 
you know, one, one of the things, if, where is the king of questions? Why? Because I'm genuinely curious about mm-hmm. anything and everything, you know, and mm-hmm. I, that's why I'm, I'm so fascinated about the curiosity code, which is what you have going on. So, so did you have, um, any challenges when it came to money, just like growing up, not having, um, you know, cause you said no one really kind of educated you on how to manage money and stuff like that. Did any of that show up as you were, you know, forging your path on this, uh, in, in, in this lifetime? It's funny, you know, you're bringing back memories. My dad was kind of cheap and <laughs> he didn't give you any money. And he, he counted all of his coins on his counter at night. Like if you wanted to grab a few p- pennies, he would know like one penny was missing. And I was like, you know, so you go to my mom and you just kind of like, hey, you know, you could sneak a couple bucks out of my mom's. But she would never know kind of thing. You know, right. I was one of those kids that would try to get a couple extra here to go go do something or whatever, right. you know. Yeah. But so it gave me a perception of how that different they were. My mom was very generous and you know, she would make sure we had everything to every place and all the, you know, access. Right. So it gave me... Um, you know, I think you always get one view of what one parent versus another. Not, they're not always the same. And sometimes that helps balance you, I think, in a way mm-hmm. sometimes. You know, if sure. they're somewhat sure. different, you get to see different perspectives. Right. But it it, it was something that you, you couldn't just take advantage of the money situation with my dad. He would uh, make sure <laughs> to, to reel you in if you tried to, to do too much. Right. And um so it wasn't like you could just have everything you wanted, but we had it pretty easy. And yeah. But then as I got older, um, my parents divorced, uh-huh. and I pretty much was on my own financially at uh-huh. that point, and I was pretty young. And I think I was probably 15, 16. Wow. So at that point, was it after I already wanted to work, because I already got turned down for that one job, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I had no problem going to work and making my own and, and thinking that way. Uh-huh. Uh, I was happy to do it, actually. Uh-huh. And it wasn't so much about the money. I just, I was so interested in it. And when I uh, would take uh, courses in high school, I took every business course they could uh, offer because I, I found out typing was like, I was good at that. And, right. and so, uh, in fact, my typing teacher used to, you know, make fun of how fast I, I, I typed. I, mean, I would be typing so fast. It would drive everybody around me crazy, you know? Because <laughs> it's so loud. Guy, I, I do remember this one student. I can't remember his name. He sat in front of me in class, and he signed my yearbook. Um, I sure hate the way you type, but I sure like the way you walk into class. And I always thought that was so funny. <laughs> and I thought... Well, that was sweet, you know, but it was like, I did, I drove everybody, because I would type so fast that if you're typing 40 and the ones next to you is typing 100, it just makes you (laughs) fine, you know? Right. uh, So I I took to to business really fast, and that was my thing, and I liked it, and I, and um, all of us got into sales, all my siblings, we Mm -hmm. all had a lot of personality, we were all Mm -hmm. very loud and outgoing kind of people, and it just, you know, kind of lended itself to sales. Yeah. And that's where I ended up with pharmaceutical sales and, and um, uh-huh. you know, mortgage sales, real estate sales. I mean, I was in all kinds of sales. Right, right. And, and and so when when the money came in, did you just innately know what to do with it, or was it? What yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the thing is, is another reason I think that we all went that way wasn't so much about money as it was competition. We, my dad made us so extremely competitive. Uh, which is so funny because I just interviewed Molly Bloom on my show today, uh-huh. who, you know, Molly's Game, the movie, uh-huh. and uh-huh. she went to jail from doing all this stuff. And her dad kind of reminded me of mine in the movie. And it, it was this competition thing, this like you had to win no matter what. And I think it was more about winning than it was making the money mm-hmm. in sales just to beat the competition to be the best yeah. kind of thing. And, and with that came money. Right. Now, now, it's always interesting, you know, I mean, one of my biggest challenges growing up was I thought I was bad with money because I didn't didn't know how to manage the money after it came in. And I just thought maybe I just don't know how to make money, which was really un- not accurate because making money was not the problem. I had no problems bringing in whatever uh-huh. amount of money I needed because I, was, I got into sales as well. It's like, uh-huh. oh, I could just, uh-huh. I just make more money. Right. Right. Right, right. But it's what happened when the money entered my world that was the, the, yeah. the, the biggest challenge. So, um, it's what, just tough what, when you're young, yeah. you know, I, I think for me, the biggest thing was, I think you all have a time when you're younger 
that maybe you put too much on credit than you would normally than you would now or you know what i mean right. it, it, you start you're new, you're newly married when you're young you need drapes you need a washing machine you need whatever carpet or right. that you didn't come yeah. with and so i actually became a quicken almost addict i love quicken when i, I as soon as it came out but before it came out I, I've created a spreadsheet uh, before Excel. That's a long time ago. Though. There was no computers. All you know, um, they had. I, I put a spreadsheet together almost, and I would keep track of all the bills and every month of what I, the balances were. Uh-huh. And it was just kind of a fun to see it go down for me the, the amount, even though I probably charged too much and I shouldn't. Have. <laughs> It became, a com- it became a competitive, self-competitive thing. Say, how quickly right. can I get this down type of thing? Right. And it, I, I still kind of have that. I, I, I like that. I like seeing the, the changes of, of the stocks going up or the money, you know, but debt going down. Yeah. And I was interested in finance just kind of just, odd, you know, naturally because uh, I, I tend to be quantitative and uh-huh. – I, I think logically, yeah. and I, money kind of lends to that. You know sure. what I mean? I and I, I never wanted to. Oh, I don't like it when people borrow stuff from me as much, and so I don't want to borrow from other people because. Mm-hmm. So I just never was a type that wanted to borrow money. I remember when my friend went to college; she was going to get a student loan, and I was thinking, oh, I would never do that. <laughs> you know, I was going to go. I paid for my own college. I paid right. for my own wedding. I paid for everything of my own stuff which is kind of interesting considering my background. Uh, but I paid for all of that. And then I, I, I would rather work full time and pay it right then than to know I owed it. It just, I, I, that debt of having student debt, I would not have done. I, I mean, unless it maybe it was Harvard to be a doctor or something that right. I knew, right. you know, it was a done deal that you could do it. I, I don't think I would have ever done that. Yeah. I, it sounds like you picked that up, um, that, that, um, that precision in terms of the, the the ledger and everything like from your dad because of how he was with knowing what what everything Maybe. that was going on with the money uh-huh. right yeah and then because yeah. we tend to be a blend of our parents when it, especially when it comes to like the money story and stuff like that mm-hmm. because if yeah. your mom's really generous and stuff like that then it's not like you're being stingy about it either you're just when it comes to you you kind of so it looks like you picked that up from your I dad. Teach you. Yeah, I, I'm very organized from him, but I'm real generous from my mom. Like my right. kids, they can have anything they want, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I got to not go out shopping with them, right. especially my youngest. You got to watch her. But <laughs> it's so funny because when she was little, I give you know the Toys R Us would have those catalogs, you know that they they put in the Sunday paper right. of all the cool toys, you know. Yeah. And I'd give both my daughters this magazine and say, "Is there anything you guys might like for Christmas? Why don't you?" circle the things that you might like my oldest daughter would give it back and there'd be like three cool things you know and then my other one would give it back and it was, everything would be circled. <laughs> <laughs> the entire magazine wow that's so funny that you say that because i used to do the exact same thing with my daughter like two months huh? before christmas we would go on a shopping spree in in, mm-hmm. in toys r us Mm-hmm. And we would have a cart, and we just push around the. So she just throw whatever she wants in there, <laughs> and then when we get to the, I mean, obviously said if it if it can't fit in there, then we can't throw it in there, right? Mm-hmm. And by the end, we would go through the whole entire inventory, and I would say, now you get to pick ten things from here out of the entire thing that you want. But uh, we do it like far along before Christmas, uh, so uh-huh. this is kind of selfish on my. So I don't have to guess what she wants. <laughs> But by the time Christmas comes around, she totally uh-huh. forgets like what she uh-huh. wanted. Oh, that's what she got. funny. That is so good. That's yeah. Funny. So it, it is funny the way you are with your children. You know what I mean? You just. Um, my husband is more um, practical. He he's uh-huh. not. He doesn't. He wouldn't go out and buy a three hundred fifty dollar prom dress for my daughters or something. Right. He would think, well, "Why would you spend that kind of money?" Oh, for that's something? a guy I mean, thing. Too. Right. Right. <laughs> So Go rent it's, it. kind of a, it's yeah, it's kind of a joke in our family because no matter what it is, my kids would tell my husband it's hundred dollars. Everything's a hundred dollars, <laughs> and so when he'd go to go buy something and it wouldn't be a hundred dollars, he'd be like, you what know, what happened to the hundred dollars? <laughs> I like, only yeah. bought a hundred dollar bill. What are you talking about? What happened? <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a big joke, and so he knows that we do it, but you know, it's he's like, stop it! I know it's not a hundred dollars. <laughs> Now, I, you know, I think I think this is really cool because 
I think you came into this world innately with what we like to call, I mean, I mean, you've already taken our assessment, so we talked about the money gene and the, the innate understanding of understanding how what it takes to make money, the inflow and the outflow. You, I think you have a natural built-in understanding of that, and that's and then you basically capitalize on that. I mean, growing up and everything, and so. Yeah. You know. Well, it is interesting to uh, learn more about finance. I, I completely the way I took to a typewriter was how I took to Quicken. Okay. Uh, I just. I'm like, this is so cool. You can see how much money you'd have if you put in this calculation, that calculation. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I just, I, to me, I know a lot of people don't really find that that exciting. Neither one of my kids has this quicken thing. You know, like, they're like, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't think I have it either, despite being in the money niche. <laughs> no, it's, it's something that I just, I could. I, that's why I, I wor- still keep a PC to this day. Is uh-huh. probably because of quicken, because the PC, the Mac version of it quicken sucks. is awful. Oh, it's, it's terrible. Awesome. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah, terrible. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm waiting. I'll probably switch to a Mac if they ever have it all in the cloud where it all is the same, you know? They have QuickBooks uh-huh. in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. So I'm expecting that. But yeah. um, it, I, I think I got more into the financial aspects um, when I, I was a pharmaceutical rep forever. And there really wasn't any financial discussions in that job so much, you know, right. and, except for your expense report, and, which I love doing because I was this nerd <laughs> that liked to do paperwork. <laughs> so when I left, I wanted to get a job that was all paperwork, which everybody thought I was crazy for that. And I got a job as a loan officer because I thought, well, what has work <laughs> done, right? Yep. And that, that was, you know, more money management, more understanding. And what I really saw from that job is the emotional co- connection people selling uh, you know b2b b to c differences you know when you're right. b2c and you're taking money that from them and saying you know hey, i'm going to help you but you have not every bit of control over if the you know la- the rate changes or whatever right you, i saw such uh, an emotional connection mm-hmm. these people had with their money that it gave me a different perspective of it and I think it was a really good job to have for that just to kind of have because everybody looks at it so differently and it's it's you can make people so much more at ease if you understand that when you're in that kind of sales job and then I got some really great uh underwriter training when I was a loan officer at another um job so I, I got a lot of financial backgrounds and I started to write about um Actually, I got into the writing. I wasn't even going to ever be a writer. I never thought about it. I right. took a write. Right. I took a writing course just for something to do one day, and um, I was curious. I was curious, <laughs> and um, I took a course. And the professor of the course had us write something, and and I picked a uh, personal finance topic as I was in lending at that point. Right, yeah. so I wrote a book. Uh, I can't even remember what I wrote in her class, but she turned out to be a big New York Times bestselling author and a agent, and she wanted me as a client. And she wanted me to write all these personal finance books. She thought I could be like the next Susie Orman, and all. I'm like, I don't want to write about personal finance. I mean, I, this would be fine for one book, you know what I, know. I mean? You know, that wasn't my life passion, right? But so we did. We were working on a book there for a while. I was going to have a personal finance book, but it just wasn't my total passion and that's when I ended up writing about online education and then yeah. career and personality and all that stuff I ended up writing about but she did get me interested in writing yeah no that's that's really cool because I think I think what's been what I'm getting here is that your biggest driver in terms and this is probably why uh, your most recent book is going to come out the way it is the title the way it is is hmm. you just have this innate curiosity of of anything that happens to come across your path you know, it's yeah. like, oh, and especially when it comes to like money and typewriting or finances <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, it, yeah. anything that has to do with something that's quantifiable um, yeah. and it just kind of draws you into it. Now, if you're forced to do this and pick that as a niche, well, then I think, no, I don't want to do that, but I'm just curious about it, right? And then you just ran with it. I lo- Well, I have that real competitive side of me that wants to know how hard something is and if I can conquer it kind of you know and so <laughs> but there there are topics that do not interest me yeah. and you know I, I wish I was better at sports I wish I you know at knowledge and, and yeah. political knowledge I'm not that strong and and uh, uh, you're not missing historical <laughs> you know some of the <laughs> I'm not missing much yeah so you know there are areas where I wish I I, I get better as I get older but I, I I would just do horribly at Jeopardy if you know because it's that <laughs> goes that direction right right 
It's like, you just like avoid that one category. I keep hoping that they're going to ask a grammar question or something. (laughs) Or something about money or something like that. Yeah. (laughs) So I, uh, yeah, those, I, I kill it. I kill it. But you know, they're asking me, uh, geography questions, man, I just tank it. So, you know, everybody's got their areas of interest in, in, um, I think when I was writing about what held people back from being curious, mm-hmm. a lot of it was our environment. You know, mm-hmm. you you grow yeah. up with people that say this is what's interesting. This is what you need to find interesting, right. and you kind of get they forced. tell you, do you need to yeah. be interested in this? You, you need to know this. And I grew up in a family that was all sports. Maybe that's why I shut down. It's <laughs> like no, no more sports. Oh. <laughs> It's so much sports. I mean, I, my dad would have the announcer going in his ear, like we'd be at weddings and things, and you'd hear the announcer coming through his, my, right. the, you know, like, oh, you know. For me, it was soap operas. <laughs> right, right. I, no soap operas. No soap operas. Yeah. But, uh, no drama. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it is an interesting um, thing that you can either have your environment talk you into being totally one way Mm -hmm. or maybe turn you off from something right as you get overwhelmed like i'm sick of hearing this you know if i hear one more sports announcer i'm gonna kill myself you know but uh you just don't know i mean i look at my niece and she could not be more interested in sports i mean she's just a you know it's like her life and my sister brother same way they're just everything i'm the only one didn't wow so So, you're different i mean everybody. Yeah, everybody's different. That's why your 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 fascination and curiosity and your obsession with assessments of all sorts and everything. And <laughs> you know, you and I just talked about how 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 important it is and what what a um um what a I don't say bad idea, but what a um, <laughs> it, it depriving someone of the opportunity to have a little bit more a better results in in this in the work that we do you know consulting mm-hmm. and coaching and and helping mm-hmm. others and stuff like that i mean let's 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 go into that a little bit more because uh i think we talked a great deal about the money piece and so mm-hmm. uh obviously i mean well one thing i want to say to to kind of like wrap that little section up is what do you say to people who don't have that fascination that curiosity on on the money piece and you know because obviously you don't need that specifically in order to be create financial success the way you've been able to do it but I mean, for someone who doesn't have that level of interest, you know, I mean, based on what you've seen in the world of, you know, the the Forbes world, if you will, and helping people, you know, understand business and stuff like that. You know, in business, you can't know everything. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. the really good leaders are the ones who admit they don't know everything. And they hire people or they surround themselves with people who embrace the qualities that they aren't great at. I mean, how much code did Steve Jobs write? I mean, he didn't, you have to, right? So right. he had, to, okay. Right. He, that doesn't mean he doesn't appreciate the code writing. Right. So it's, it's something that you need to, if you're not good at it, it doesn't mean you, you have to embrace it, but you know, you, it, it, you have to appreciate, you know, how to stay within budgets and there's a certain amount that you have to understand, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean you have to go into a financial job. You don't have to get a degree in finance and go to wall street. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I think for an entrepreneur that wants to be successful and they're not really great at the money aspect, I think that they definitely need coaching mm-hmm. if they need somebody from an outside perspective of right. how to get by, but, and they also should hire really good people for that kind of thing and, and focus on their strengths. I mean, right. It, it's I usually people who want to start their own business have some uh, idea of the the money and, and involved, but it, you know what you would hope. Yeah. Well, you know it's yeah, but you know you get these people that just they're fine. They lose it all. They go ah, and just do it again. And for me, <laughs> that would be a lot harder. I right. mean, I you know I I wouldn't want to lose it all. You know, I, I'm yeah. not a huge yeah. gambler. Yeah. But yeah. for some people, that's their biggest learning is yeah. when they do lose it all and they go, oh well, okay. And then they just do it again. I, right. I wish I had more of that quality, actually. That's yeah. a pretty Well, I, I, I could show you lots of stories about that quality. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you can have too much of that. But, yeah. But some of the best entrepreneurs have lost it all. You know, there there is one of those things. It's 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 those stove touchers, of, you know, that like to go out there and say, it's hot. It's hot. What do you mean? 
you know, and you touch it, it's like, yeah. oh, you're right, it's hot. Oh, okay, well, now I know, and you know not to go there. I mean, the key right. thing is, you know, the ones who do it over and over again and repeat the same mistake, and that's that's a problem, you know. Yeah, that is a problem. But when you, when you learn in a very cathartic way on what not to do, you know, mm-hmm. and then you can speak to it, that's why some of the, the stories that I tell when I'm on stage and stuff like that are so visceral because people are like, oh, my God, I don't want to go through that. And it's like... You know, he's like, yeah, yeah vicariously experience catharsis through me, so you don't have to take yourself yeah, to that right, again, right. right? Yeah. But um, but yeah, I I totally agree, and and so let's let's start going into the what it is that you do now because you know it's so funny the journey that you've gone through. I was a loan officer too. I didn't do the pharmaceutical stuff. I wanted to because I think uh-huh. it would have been fun. I did the boiler room stuff. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What do you mean by th- <laughs> I? <laughs> Being stuck in a little boiler room, making phone calls, dialing for dollars, oh, those types of things, you know. Dollars, right. Yeah, not you literally a boiler room. You phone book and say, here, dial. Yeah, yeah or even job. just like a queue and you just sit there and just on the phone all day long yeah. making sales yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and eventually you found yourself as you're going through this journey on, you know, what it means to sell, what it means to do, to, to work with people. How did you end up deciding that and landing on the niche that you're in right now? And, and let's talk about what your niche is right now specifically. It's, you know, it's really hard to come up with a good elevator pitch for me or to say what I'm doing because I do so many different things. I know you have a podcast I, show, which is great. I have, yeah, it's a radio, uh-huh. AM, FM, and podcast. Nice. And it's, yeah, it's nationally syndicated. It's everywhere. It's on C-Suite Radio. It's all over the place. But how did um, you end up getting there to be syndicated and everything? Like, was it just something that was? I, I well, okay, I wasn't even planning on having a radio show, which mm-hmm. is at all, or a podcast. I wasn't planning on any of that. I had been working um, as an prof- online professor for years, mm-hmm. and I was, as you said, running the MBA program at Forbes School of Business, and mm-hmm. I just had left that position, but I was still working with them part-time as a, right. an associate right. professor, associate faculty, I should say. And um, as part of my job with them, I would interview very interesting people like Ken Fisher, the billionaire behind Fisher Investments, and, and right. people like that would come to, as part of Forbes to speak at our speaker events. So I really enjoyed interviewing. I mean, Ken, I, who wouldn't love interviewing Ken Fisher? He was the coolest guy, you know, interesting, so interesting. Yeah. And yeah. so people like that, John Tamney, another Forbes uh, editor, so interesting. You know, it's really interesting guys. So I left that, and I liked that part of it. It was really um, – that was the hard part of leaving that job because that was really cool. But um, I decided to go back to do more speaking and uh, writing and the stuff that I – consulting mm-hmm. and the things I do now. And my – my intent <laughs> was to uh, update my website with just having a few people in, like this kind of thing interview yeah. me. Yeah. I have a, a few more videos and audio things to put on my site. Well, the first guy who interviews me has an AM FM nationally syndicated radio show. Uh-huh. And I loved him. He was great. You know, we're talking and um, I'm like at the end, of, after we got off the show, I go, oh, that's kind of cool. How'd you get that? And he said, oh, well, there's one opening, you know, I could t- give you, you know, the guy's name. And so I ca- they said, yeah, but you got to start in two weeks. And we have, you know, <laughs> never done this before. You know, I knew Camtasia for video, but that's <laughs> all I knew, right? And so I had to start in two weeks, and I had to have all the guests lined up. And you would need at least six guests a week for the two, you know, because I had three hours because it airs oh. a.m. Um, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time every right. week. So. right. And this guy had put two people on a show. So I figured, oh, I'll put two people on a show. That's six people a week. I can do that. So I had to find I had, But that that wasn't the hard part because you could go on LinkedIn. You have connections. Yeah. You, you know, I knew people. People, um, boy, just learning how to get it to the from a cell phone to a computer was the hardest part, right. you know, because it, I'm like, there's no attachment. You know, how does that get there? You know, right. so uh, it took me a little bit, but um, that was only... It, I think it was February 28th in 2017. Oh, that was last year. Yeah, but I've interviewed like 500 people since then. Wow. Uh, right, yeah. right. Because you yeah. have six people. We- <laughs> Holy cow. That's like, wow. <laughs> A lot. And, and it's not live, though. It's pre recorded or? It's pre recorded. Got it. 
And, uh, you know, I, I have interviewed probably five, six billionaires. I've had, you know, everybody, I, there's a Craig from Craigslist. You know, there's like all these cool people. I've had yeah. Keith Proc from um, DocuSign and all these really amazing people. Uh, Richard Stallman, who created GNU, the Linux software guy, you know. Uh, you get really fascinating people and then they know people and, you know, it just snowballed from there. Very yeah. cool. Wow. So I just kept, I had been writing, though, for a while. I, okay. I wrote my uh, I guess after I left pharmaceuticals and lending and all that, uh -huh. I, I um, around the time I guess I wanted to see how hard it was to get a PhD. I, I, that competitive, <laughs> I, was like, I wonder how hard it is. To get <laughs> like how hard can this be? Um, I I had a and master's. was it hard? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty hard. <laughs> it was not as hard. It, it well, it would have been harder if you're like gonna do you know like cure cancer or something. You know, I mean, right. it just depends what your dissertation's about. But um, I had a master's because I had uh, when I was in pharmaceutical sales, my company had paid for my master's, oh, and nice. uh, yeah. And I thought, well, I love online education, and, and when I got out, I thought this is like the best thing that people can because I went to school when I was in college at night from seven to ten every night. I wanted to shoot myself. Oh, I mean, God. it was awful, and I wanted. I thought this online thing is like the best thing ever. Yeah. So I started teaching online, uh -huh. and uh, I eventually started teaching. I think I was teaching for ten schools all at one time at, at my peak. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. Well, because they'll give you one class here or one class yeah. there. Sometimes they don't give you any. You know what I mean? So right. you had to have a whole lot of them to keep you busy. And so that's how I got into online education. And uh, I've but, seen that uh, firsthand. My ex girlfriend was a, a, is a, uh, she has a PhD in psychology um, and is a professor over at uh, Laverne University. And oh. um, so during the summers, she would teach on all these online universities. You know, and it actually pays really well because yeah. they pay because they have low overhead, so they can, they, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the tuition is, you know, not significantly, you know, less, and so yeah. he was making really good money in the summertime. And I was like, mm -hmm. going, wow, you should just do this full time. I mean, just, <laughs> hey, you don't have to go anywhere. So, I know a lot of people love like that better than they do being in person. Some people like the the feeling of being in front of the crowd, right. kind of, you know. For me, I love the virtual just because I like to work at four in the morning. I'm a crazy person, and no one else wants to take my class at that time, you know. So uh, I'm up, okay? Right. So it's time to work. But you also do live speaking events yeah. too. I do. I right. do. You know, and I I speak about a lot of the topics um, I teach. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've taught, like you said, more than a 1,000 business courses, and I, I, I focus on a lot of the things that are – around behavioral issues mm -hmm. because I, my dissertation on emotional intelligence and its important and its impact on sales performance right so mm -hmm. an emotion i have qualified to give them my, you know a myers-briggs emotional intelligence test and a lot of these other tests and so um a lot of people hire me to talk about soft skills uh emotional intelligence uh generational conflict mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and just behaviors in general and then um i i, I got the most interested in like engagement and culture and some of the things that are everybody's worried about having low engagement numbers. Everybody's worried about cultural problems and, mm -hmm. and it's all the things are starting to lead now with AI and technology that I think the next big thing everybody's going to be talking about is more innovation more than anything else. And in my mind, I'm like, well, what ties in to making people more innovative? Well, you got to ask more questions. You got to be more interested in trying to solve problems. And, you know, right. so you need, thinking skills you need certain skills and yeah. to me yeah. curiosity just i mean what's more important i mean every einstein I, quote in the world is about curiosity look I him agree. up <laughs> yeah no i agree <laughs> yeah you know and, and and that's why i love where you're going with this the curiosity code because you know whenever i talk to when i happen to work with students and clients who are coaches mm -hmm. and consultants as well um, and they're asking about how do I network better how do i um close better and you know how mm -hmm. do i do in my sales conversation and inevitably, I always mention throughout the whole process that you need to show up with childlike curiosity without any attachment. You know, the literally right. the kid that says, why is the sky blue without knowing why it is blue and just really wanting to know and mm -hmm. finding those elements throughout your conversation. So that way, you know, people can people will actually feel that you're genuinely interested when you have that childlike curiosity showing up every single time you talk to somebody. 
I, well, you know how we mentioned um, environment is a big factor that influences, but what you're mm-hmm. talking about, I think, uh, is a, another big factor is our assumptions. Mm-hmm. We just assume we know the answers, oh, yeah. or okay. we don't think we're going to be interested, or we're going to assume they're going to act this way or that way, or yeah. we're afraid. Yeah. Actually, I came up with four things that impact curiosity. It's mm-hmm. fear. Our assumptions, like I just mentioned, right. technology, either it does it for us or we don't know how to figure it out or, right. you know, we're afraid of it and environment. So there's really four big, big things in the environment. Uh, talk about family, teachers, uh, you know, peers, all that social right. media, all that stuff can all impact what we think we should do or shouldn't do. Uh-huh. And I, I wanted to look at these things to determine just what. Um, is impacting you and, because I think a lot of people don't realize a lot of it um, is really impacting their curiosity. And right. it, I, the only way you can get, improve really is to get a baseline. It's just like emotional intelligence. You get a baseline mm-hmm. of where you are so you know where to go from there, right? right. So uh, I'll tell you what. It was challenging to create a curiosity assessment. Well, I mean, I co- well- I mean any assessment, being able to codify and have the norms to support, you know, based on the results and everything like that. It was, yeah. You know, I, I had Thank to, God I had you got your PhD so analysis. you learned how to research. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, I'm not a PhD in statistics. You know? <laughs> and I, so I was hiring these people to help me. Right. And they weren't getting my results that I thought it should have. And I'm looking at what they were doing. I'm like, well, no, that, that's not what I'm trying to find. So I thought... Well, how hard could it be to figure out my own statistics? I taught right. myself factor analysis, and I um, <laughs> so competitive. It's like, I, I, I can do to, it better. I had to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, you should see me. And I'm looking at the Excel spreadsheet. I'm going, yeah. Well, you got that. Well, look what I got. You know. And so, <laughs> I did. I got real competitive, and right. it ended up proving those four factors were the four factors I wanted. Wow. And, um, so that was kind of cool, yeah. to, to do that, but it was really challenging. That oh, was I'm one sure. Of but I mean, I think that's what you thrive on. You thrive on the challenges in life so that you can up level yourself over and over again. And, yeah. and I think there's something to be said about for all entrepreneurs out there is, is how do you keep motivated? How do you keep yourself moving forward to grow your business and not be complacent with, oh, this is where my business is at? Is that mm-hmm. constant challenge of, you know, wanting to kind of, you know, continue to grow you know and and yeah. i think i think part of your curiosity code can help people find that right i mean yeah. why you know just let's 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 basically ask that question someone's listening to this curiosity code, but why would i want a code or do uncode or unlock or understand my my curiosity code what does it actually show me so that and why do i want to know that well i'd hope they'd ask that that would show they were curious but i think a lot of <laughs> i'm curious <laughs> but i I think, like with, as with, I should say, emotional intelligence, the people who really probably need to develop it aren't really that curious about it. You know what I mean? They don't think about it. They don't worry about it. It's not up top of their list. So that's why I think you really have to talk to CEOs and people to kind of have that conversation with people right. saying, yeah. you know, this is really important to us that you're aligned with the right job. Uh-huh. That maybe you'd be happier, in, you know, if we knew exactly what, you know, think of engagement numbers, what we got a third of the workplace engaged, right? right and right. two thirds <laughs> just aren't walking dead zombies, right. don't really mm-hmm. like what they're doing. If we could get people to talk and uh, and explain what they're interested in and ask questions and be mm-hmm. curious, mm-hmm. I, I, in my research, I was aligning it with critical thinking, with engagement, with um productivity, mm-hmm. you know, innovation, all these things mean more money for both people, for the right. employee, right. for the employer. I looked at it in the workplace more. I'm not looking at kids, you right, know, right. developing right. curiosity because that's a whole nother book. Kids are probably. just born curious. I mean, well, mm-hmm. you know, it is, they are, you know, around four years old and then you start seeing it go <laughs> down a little bit, you know, yeah. <laughs> after a while. Uh, and I, I've said this uh, to somebody else. I was on a show, um, but there was, I was on a bus going snow skiing in Vail, and there was a little girl, a Hispanic family in the back, and this little girl, she just kept saying, por qué, mama, por qué? She said it like a hundred times, you know, what, why in Spanish, yeah. you know, and uh-huh. it's, it's every culture, they all, the they kids, have it. Why? they why? all have why? it, they want to know. <laughs> and it, I, I really think, though, that the people that w- want to know, um, They'll, of course, buy the book. But I, I think the people who don't really realize how important curiosity 
uh, is, we'll start to hear the buzz about it. You know, they're going to hear more about it, which will make them more curious to want to read it. But, But I really think that it's up to leaders to say this is important to us to be productive, to be innovative, right. to make sure that your uh, goals align with the company goals. Mm-hmm. To and you know, there's no downside right. to developing right. curiosity. You're going to get better, more entrepreneurial thinking people. Right. So, yeah. so, so walk me through a process with this curiosity. How this would actually be used in a real, real world situation? Well, either use either use your book or use your process in uh-huh. in, in their business. Walk me through. Well, okay, so they can buy the book or they can buy the book. I'm going to have it so that it'll be on my site. So they can right. buy the book, yeah. and if they buy the book on my site, they'll be able to get the curiosity code um, with it. Right. So what they do with that is, so there's a book that explains all the curiosity elements, and it's a whole regular book. And then they can take the assessment online, mm-hmm. which gives you, similar to like a Myers-Briggs, a DISC, a EQI, it gives you a PDF file that shows you what your scores are right. and yeah. your levels of fear, right. assumptions, technology, and environment. Then it gives you an action plan of how to improve in all these areas. Mm-hmm. And if anybody's done anything similar with engagement from like a Gallup survey or mm-hmm. those kinds of things where you work with others, if you want, you know, your boss or something, you can right. work out a plan. To, this is what I want to do. And I give examples for each of the areas, um, how to set uh, measurable goals mm-hmm. and how to in- improve. And, mm-hmm. and it's little incremental things they can do to improve right. so that they, they'll develop curiosity. I mean, there's so many just small things that people don't even, they just are so focused on doing one thing one way, just drive home a different way street one time or do something just some little things to start if it's too much you know what i mean and then but then there's bigger more complex goals you know it just depends where you are of how much it it makes you uncomfortable but i I think that once you work on these things i really think we're going to get way uh better alignment with people with jobs that they like and they're doing things that they want i think a lot of people don't do jobs that they would like because they don't even know what they would like right. nobody's right. ever asked them they've never looked into anything mm-hmm. they were always told in our family we do this job we're all you know doctors or lawyers or whatever it is shoemakers you know? <laughs> or what did you say shoemakers shoemakers <laughs> So so, right. so so I don't know what I was thinking. Why didn't you do that? It's like, why aren't you a shoemaker? What's wrong with you? Why aren't you a Bundy? So I so so <laughs> what I'm getting is that that it, I think it's for leaders or businesses that are looking for self-driven innovation to happen within their ranks, within their teams, and everything like that. Well, and, at the highest level, of right. course, at it the goes. Highest. They yeah. could. This is written for every level mm-hmm. of working adult so it's not going to be so intense that you have to be a leader to read this sure. it, it's yeah it's going to be very simple as if you as a lot of books are um about curiosity and drive and motivation mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. make sure that it gets to the people who really need it right and, and this quantifies so, it this is a code that they can actually use it and they can quantify it versus just kind of like this yeah. nebulous like oh you got to be curious you got to be this there's nothing out there like it i mean nothing you know it, when you do research, you're always looking for gaps in the literature. You know, that's what you. I, I was a doctoral chair, so I would help my doctoral students get through their dissertation process. And mm-hmm. the first thing you tell them to do is, you know, work on chapter two to look at what's out there and research that's on the topic you're interested in. Mm-hmm. And then you look for like what isn't somebody studying, what needs to be studied. And so I started looking at the curiosity assessments. And I'm like, well, there's a few out there, and they're good. You know, they're good. What the fascination one or something like that? Or what, the, well, that? yeah, that's fascinating. That's Sally Hogshead. Yeah, yeah. She's, <laughs> hers is, that's more fascinating. That's more marketing. But there's, uh, she's great, by the way. Um, but they, uh, there's more things like Cashton and a lot of other uh, researchers are looking at what curiosity is and if you are curious. Uh-huh. And I wasn't so interested in that because it's already been measured, right? I was interested in what's keeping you from being curious because once you know what's keeping you from being curious, then you can do something about it. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see the blend of, uh, of our technology and the curiosity code to kind of augment that little, I mean, to kind of like even be more precise. But it'd be interested for us to talk offline about that because I think it'd be something yeah. because you've already got a chance to experience the ULT. Yeah. 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 We so. should do correlation. There we go. We could do some more statistics, but this I know. time we could I'll let you all do them this time. No, no. <laughs> 
that's not my thing. I was an engineer, but still not my thing. I mean, there, I mean, there, there, we, we have probably like you know, but twenty years of data, we can actually the norms that we can actually you know put on put on your plate for you to look at and say, yeah. take a look at that. There you go. In your spare time. <laughs> yeah, in your spare time, you know. But it'll just you know that way you can see we can actually like you know even get even more norms out of everything. But um, yeah, really cool. Well, well I mean. I, you know, we we actually, like I said, I, I just happened to look at the time. We have like two minutes left. <laughs> I, I, I'm surprised we didn't run over. You know how I, we get. I We're know. like, oh, oh, it's Friday. And and, and I and I would love. I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> days come, days go by. And we're like, wait, oh, what happened? Right. To, what happened to the sun? What happened to the days? <laughs> um, so I, I actually would like. When do? You, when's the books uh, slated to come out? I mean, when is it? When are you planning? I'm hoping the end of the year. Uh, okay. I'm still working on getting the whole assessment online, but there is a page where you can be notified uh, on my website, and if you sign okay. up on that page, it will notify you, and it will give you a free uh, a PDF file of uh, just tips mm. on how to. S- get a little bit of a head start on developing your fit, your, okay. your uh, assumptions, technology, and environment. So yeah. you just would have to go to curiositycode.com. Curiositycode.com. I'm going to put that in the comments here at the Spreaker.com mm-hmm. website. Curiosity.co. Mm-hmm. And if they want to just reach out to you directly for, um, for, for, for any reason, you know, maybe mm-hmm. kind of like to have a conversation with you, talk about maybe having you come in, work in their business, whatever, you know, how, mm-hmm. do, they, how do they reach you? Well, you can reach me through my website, which is drdianehamilton.com. Uh-huh. Um, I'm Diane at drdianehamilton.com on my website. Uh, but I'm on, I'm on all Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, everything as Dr. Diane Hamilton. So that's D-R-D-I-A-N-E-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N. Uh-huh. And so you can well. find me. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, so definitely reach out. And I would love to have you come back probably around your book launch it's just so that we can talk a little bit more about it and maybe give you a little bit um, a, a, a platform another platform just to talk about <laughs> and we'll spend more time just talking about the book <laughs> yeah it is it's, it was so fun to research it was fascinating oh, I'm sure. and, and it's so much up your alley with all the stuff that you work on with the assessments i think you it yeah. would be fun yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, we should basically just talk shop. It's just about all yeah. the different things. I need I need to take the test too, so that way I can. You do. Yeah, you do. I'm talking, I'm, now I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so very cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. This is a whole lot of fun, as 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 expected. And um and I, I'm looking forward to having you come back. We'll just have to make sure you give once you got a hard deadline and stuff like that. I'll make sure we pick a good date around that time that'll best promote and help support your uh, book launch and everything. And oh, well, thank you. It. It's always fun to to talk to you. You were so great on my show. I hope everybody checks that episode out of you on my show because that was great. We didn't even talk about money, did we? Uh, no, we actually talked about <laughs> the assessment. We actually talked about. Your assessment. Uh, physiometrics. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. that's basically that was what we fun. talked about. No, it was super fun. And I think it's um I, I think what what brings a lot of creatures is that we both have this natural draw towards wanting to help people understand things better. Right. You know, and then just wanting to help them shift on a more precise and more powerful way without having to waste too much time. Because you know why? Why waste time? Let's get it done. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know just, let's do get to, just do it. Just do it. Just get it where I want to go. And I have a feeling that you know we may even have an opportunity to share a stage one of these days because there's so many things out. Because we're both speakers. We both speaking around. I've spoken speaking. Yeah. We both speaking. Speaking. We're both speaking. Yeah. Speaking pretty good. <laughs> we speak. That's great. <laughs> okay, right. so before we go off the rails before too much, back, yeah. <laughs> make oh, sure you guys done. reach out um, if you're curious. <laughs> which if you're not, then there's something wrong. As <laughs> and I, we can fix that. <laughs> we can fix that. Go to the curiositycode.com or go if you want to reach out to, directly to Dr. Diane Hamilton. Go to drdianehamilton.com or Diane at drdianehamilton.com. Uh, really easy to talk to. Really, really easy to get. Despite the success that she has, she's not difficult to connect with. <laughs> Um, uh, as you can probably tell, and, and a whole lot of fun as well. So, again, okay. thank you so much, Diane. Uh, uh, stick around for a little bit after we uh, wrap up, and then we can debrief a little bit, okay? Um, so that's our show for this week. Again, if you found this episode to be valuable, and if you didn't, then you probably should go to curiositycode.com and wonder why and be curious as to why <laughs> you didn't find it valuable. <laughs> but And if you know of someone else that could benefit from what we talked about today, for, you know, share it. I mean, 
review us on iTunes, Spreaker, or like the episode on YouTube Live. And actually, did you even know? Did you know that we even have a Facebook group called the Money Lab? Join us there to dive in deeper with all the de- different bad money story elimination strategies, and also talking about strategies such as how to be more curious. So that's pretty much it. And that is a wrap. Take this week to apply the knowledge from today. Have an amazing week. And we'll catch you next week on the Money Lab Live podcast where we will have entrepreneur, author, speaker, and executive coach called the instigator of inspiration, Michelle Molitor. Okay, And this is Way from the Six Figure Academy and Dr. Diane Hamilton, the curiosity expert, <laughs> signing off. All right, so I think Ah. that is a wrap. Let me go ahead and make sure we say goodbye to YouTube land. Bye, Mm -hmm. YouTube land. Thank you guys so much for those of you who are uh, watch or am watching. Um, Dr. Diane is also signing off as well. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll catch you guys next week.